Maggie. Yes. Hi. Hi, everyone. My name is Sim Piwe. I'm Patrick and call me Sim. So I'm the project coordinator for Play Handball here in South Africa. As, like Nicola just said, I'm presently in Cape Town. And we also have our colleague within us, who's our project coordinator in Kenya, Caroline. And yeah, look forward to the next three days. And especially today, as it's our pilot online talk. Maybe, Sim, before we start, I would just say maybe you just start with a, a short, quick of the games or the rules of the games for today that we just have it quickly explained to everyone before I'm continuing. Sorry, I've been talking and I realized just now that I'm on mute. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right, so um, welcome everyone again. So it's pretty simple. Um, for everyone who's joining today, if you can please write your name, your surname, the organization you present, as well as the country you're in, that is a part of your registration, so that at the end we can sort of um, put together a nice report about who was who and who joined from where. And it's important, please, that during these talks, the next three days, your microphone should be on mute and your camera off throughout. Um, only when you want to say something, you should unmute your camera, sorry, your audio. Um, otherwise, I think between Nicola and I, we can mute people. So please don't think we are being rude, we're being nice. Um, as you know, or as per the email I sent yesterday, if you have any questions for our speakers, please write the questions in the Zoom chat. And yeah, basically I'll be looking and checking the chat box to see if there are any questions. Um, and please note that not all the questions will be asked to the speakers because we only have one hour, 30 minutes. I'll choose randomly the questions. And please importantly, when you ask a question, please write Q, colon, and the name of the speaker you want to ask the question to, and the question. And I've made an example there. So it's Q, Sipiwe, do you still play handball in South Africa? so that I know who the question is for and that the question is clear. Um, yeah, that's about it, Nico. Great, thank you, Sim. Cool, okay. Um, as I said, um, great. Everyone is joining here in. So I want to do that one, minimize it. Great, okay. Good. So um, thank you Sim, for explaining. So as you said, to just have a good conversation, we have everyone else who is not in the spotlight today off their camera and off their microphone, but all the questions, we will really make sure that we can answer your question and post your question to the speakers. And there we come. I really like to welcome today actually our uh, four speakers from different places. Um, so we have on the left side and my left side, so I don't know how it's on your screen, but there is um, Adam Lund from, he's a Swedish handball player, but plays in the, at the TVB Stuttgart in the Bundesliga in Germany. And welcome Adam today. We're really happy to have you here. On my right, <laughs> it's actually Kuda Chitsema. He is from the Secretary General from the Western Province Handball Association, also the coach at the um, Cape Stars Handball Club. So we really welcome Kuda as well to give his um, experience and an insight about the situation in South Africa and the Western Cape. And we have as well Perslich Samugadza with us. I hope I pronounced it right, Percy, um, if you don't mind. <laughs> And he is actually joining in today from Zimbabwe. He is a development officer at the sports and recreation in Zimbabwe and also a former national player and has been also started a, a, a handball league in Harare and beyond. So I'm really happy to have him here as well. And beside um, Grace um, Madegua, I can't you see her at the moment in my screen, but Grace Madegua, she is joining in from Kenya. She has been one of the best national players, at FEMA national players in Kenya, and uh, also assistant coach for the youth team um, 
in Kenya. So I'm really happy to have her as well and reflecting on the site, how handball is actually played and organized in Kenya. So um, before we um, starting with the question, I just want to give a short overview. Why are we doing this talk today? And um, so as Play Handball, we are a youth and sports development organization. And our aim is actually to use handball to give perspective to the youth. And this means we want, would like to grow opportunities and present opportunities for the youth by educating and helping community organizations that might be clubs, but, but there are also a lot of like social organizations on the ground, on grassroots level to help them to build capacity, to create new knowledge, but also to start an exchange. We have been doing that through volunteers, but also with this online talks, we would like now to start a dialogue across borders. So where we can meet on a like virtual digital table and just discuss with each other, um, how is the situation? What is your experience? Um, how have you been able to develop yourself to where you are now with handball or how is actually what is being done in your country for handball development? And today topic, will be, we will speak today about handball training, handball leagues in times of COVID-19. It's, uh, it's yeah, a topic, the pandemic has been affected everyone, everywhere over the world. No one could think about this um, dimension at the beginning of the year, but um, I think everyone has been kind of their major experience. And I would like to discuss that a bit with you, but also beside the pandemic, pandemic, I would also like to see how have you been able anyway to to grow with handball and what have you been doing there. So I would like to start and um, Adam, maybe I would like from your side, um, you are a player at the TVB Stuttgart at the moment in Germany. And um, so I would like Maybe you can give us a short update just about the current situation. How is on your side? Um, yeah, tell me, how is it at the moment for you as a handball player in Germany? Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. Um, yeah, the situation since um, April, when the, the league finally got cancelled uh, due to some uh, outbursts and in infections. It has been, uh, yeah. It has been uh, a lot of um, adaptations that has been made, and uh, the current situation is uh, so that we are able to play and uh, perform, uh, but without uh, spectators. Um, so the HBL had, has put up a lot of uh, regulations and activities to make sure that that we can continue with our with our jobs and uh, and uh, make sure that the league uh, will be played until the end. Um, so it depends a little bit what happens now with the vaccines and how how this will um, what kind of fortune it will be in the in the in the begin, beginning of next year. Uh, and then we will see a little bit more how everything will evolve. But as of now, we are still playing, and we are very, we are very thankful to be able to still be able to to go to to our job and uh, and do it together. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Adam. Kuda. Um, so as Adam just explained, in Germany or with the Bundesliga, they're able to play, but without spectators. I know you also have been in South Africa. Um, the situation was quite okay, and it was um, we're getting more easy. Um, is it at the moment, are you able to play or have you been able to organize competitions um, from the Western Province Handball Association? Please tell me about more about that. Um, thank you, Nicola. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me here. Yeah? All right. Uh, um, we've been fortunate, really. Um, we went into the moment we went into level two restrictions. We were allowed to train um, so most of the clubs continued with their training um, then we went into level one um, in in september so it gave us a chance to start planning on a few tournaments because we wanted to finish off the indoor 
this uh, this year, then start with the beach handball as um, beginning next year. So we managed to put in um, two tournaments for the seniors, but we were not focusing on any junior levels at the moment because it's uh, it's harder to deal with juniors than it is to deal with seniors. So it becomes better for us to stick to the protocols when you're dealing with seniors at the moment, um, also with the numbers. So yeah, we have started playing. Um, thank you. Okay. Um, I'm not sure, Grace, are you also around here? Because I can't see you because from Grace, I would like to know, because I have in, in Germany, I know Adam knows us as well with the national teams. There was a discussion that if all the time when national teams meet and um, that there is a bigger risk of the spread of the virus because people from different areas come together. And Grace, I know you have been also um, yeah, with the youth national team. Is there any activities on your side regarding um, with training uh, national teams in Corona? Grace, are you still with us? She is still here. I've just asked her to unmute herself. Mm -hmm. Ah, good. Yeah. Hi, Grace. You're on mute. So Hello? we can't hear you. There we go. Yeah. That's better? Yes, it's very good. We can hear you now. Very clear. Thank you so much, Nicole. Maybe if you could come up with a question again. Apparently, yeah. I was... I didn't hear. Yeah, no, the question was because, like say in Germany, was there was a discussion because of the virus and especially those national teams. So mm -hmm. then all the time when national teams met because there come the players from different areas and that actually increases the risk of people getting affected, affected and there were some challenges that was also has been then carried to the club level because then the players was not available to play for the clubs. And I was wondering, because you have also the insight from Kenya, from the national team side, probably, how is it there? Is the national team training or is there no training at the moment? Um, apparently in Kenya, ever since the pandemic started, that is in March, everything was shut down. We were on lockdown for almost uh, six months. And when uh, the lockdown was lifted, still uh, we haven't been given uh, their protocol, government protocols, restricting us from going to the field. So what has been happening, people have been doing the individual training sure. and uh, individual clubs just organizing some small friendlies, but no national team training and no official league training. The government is restricted on that. We're still restricted on the, the modalities on how to start for the sports, most of the sports team to start their training. Because it means so that uh, on a kind of recreational level, training is possible and games are possible, but not on an official level if it would be um, carried out by a federation or a, like say. Yes, yes, yes. That is exactly what is taking place right now. Just oh. a few clubs setting their own training and then organizing their own friendlies, but it is not official. It is oh. something that is uh, organized just between a club and the other. Okay. Yes. Thanks. And um, yeah, please stay with us. <laughs> and I can always see you, but you can unmute yourself. Um, Percy, I personally, I was no, I got to know you started in Harare at some point, uh, the league, the handball league, and it's also spread to, to, um, further on to the province. I was wondering, how is it on your side? Is there a league at the moment going? Are there any games happening in Zimbabwe? Uh, okay, thank you so much, Nicola. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you very clear. Right, okay, thank you so much. Uh, as for the league that was played in Harare, it's quite unfortunate that is the COVID pandemic affected all sport codes. The government uh, instructed all sport codes to stop all activities in terms of uh, training and the leagues and tournaments. So what's happening at the current moment is that all sport codes were stopped, but otherwise um, recently on the 11th uh, of um, November, the government uh, gave a green light to the national teams to start their training and preparations for those national teams, either senior national teams or junior national teams that are preparing for their games to start their training sessions. But uh, the challenge that the National Association uh, was going through is the fact that 
the Minister of Health and Child Care instructed that all the teams for them to be given the clearance to start training, they are supposed to have all the players tested for COVID first, so that at least we can curb the spreading of uh, COVID virus within the handball community. So as it stands, the league is not running, uh, not only Harare, but nationwide, the leagues haven't started. But otherwise, the Handball Federation also wrote to the Sports and Recreation Commission, which is the government, uh, seeking for green light for them to start their leagues. They were given the green light to start, but the unfortunate part is that some of the clubs that are from uh, within the different setups who constitute the league, they do not have the resources to get their players uh, tested before they start to practice. So what's happening at the current moment is that the national teams are the only ones that are training, but as for the leagues in other community clubs, they are not uh, doing any activities at the current moment because of that gap. So this is the situation that is on the ground in Zimbabwe. So that means that, as I understand, thank you, Persich. Thank you so much. But it says, I understand it is that everyone needs to be tested even before they're allowed to train. Yes, yeah, sure. Okay. Kuda, can you, tell, can you tell me maybe in South Africa, how is it with the training situation? Because you just said there are happening, some games has been organized. I know there might be regulation also like as Percy or Grace just told us. So sometimes there are regulations, but sometimes people still play as long as it like everyone agrees. So how do you take it in South Africa? How is it there? What are the other advisors from the sports um, and recreation? All right. Um, thank you, Nicola. Um, initially, we waited for the government gazette to, to give us a go ahead in training. There was a government gazette in uh, early, it was early, late September that confirmed that uh, certain sports might come back to training. That's when we gave a green light to clubs to train. But we are also fortunate here that we have a few clubs in the Western Cape. So we managed to, to visit one or two, three clubs that were training. And uh, we managed to to see we managed to see what they were doing so long. Um, if they were maintaining the distance, if they were doing uh, this stuff according to the protocols, as per government gazette. So after that, we when it came to the games, we also maintained the protocols as well. Um, we had to make sure screening was done properly. And we made sure that every club has got a COVID-19 uh, compliance officer um, that for, for, to represent them, um, so that it makes it it makes it easier for us when it comes to the screening and the maintaining of the um, of the protocols on game day or on their training as well. What are protocols like? Just what what you need to do? What is like just say example? What is the, the, the social like? distancing, the the sanitizing. Um, the, 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 the wearing of masks at every given point, because when games are being played, uh, when you had the two tournaments, we made sure that um, no, uh, every official or player that is not playing mm. has to wear a mask and social distancing has to be maintained outside the perimeter of the court. So which meant that uh, those, base, those are basically the protocols as well. And uh, when they came through, we, made, we did the screening as well when we take the temperatures and we record everything so that we can have the data for every club. Okay, so that means like what it's implemented is you don't have to do like the test like as strict in Zimbabwe where they are required, you have to have a negative test, but you follow protocol and meaning like trying to um, do the screening, do the temperature, measure it, um, take the names, um, make sure that things are sanitized, people who don't play wear masks, this kind. Do the players wear a mask as well, or only the um, um, The players only wear a mask when they sit back on the bench. If you're substituted, when you sit on the bench, you wear a mask. When you go onto the field, you do not wear a mask. Okay, thank yeah. you. Adam, um, how is your experience on your side at the moment, um, like with the training, is so, or is there a difference in the training? Do you have to do also at the time like negative tests or, um, yeah, can you tell me from your side of it? Um, yeah, the trainings are, uh, we do like normal, uh, I would say, but we do rigor uh, rigorously, we test before games every, depending on the pandemic level and that uh, decides the Robert Koch Institute. Mm. We do tests, uh, we do, can do Schnell tests. We had um, our coach, got infected uh, last week and we had to 
make sure that no, no one of the players were infected. And then we did test every day before we played our game and nobody was infected, uh, luckily. Mm. And uh, just, yeah, we do, when we had a free weekend or something, we come back, then we make sure that we have uh, the mask and we change, we have two locker rooms so we don't have to be so close to, close to each other for so long. And we try to, uh, before the results are in from the tests, we, we try to be extra careful. But other than that, I would say it's going o- almost like normal, uh, especially in the, our group, because we're not doing anything else. It's just humble. And then it's, uh, we don't, yeah, everything else is almost closed. So it's, yeah, it's a safe, I would say it's safer for us than it is for a lot of the normal population, because we do, we do so much testing for trainings and games yeah okay but it does it means that um so you you feel for yourself like the training it feels really like normal besides the testing what you have to do you don't really feel or maybe wearing a mask to go to the training but while you're at the training spot and it's it feels yeah safe and good and it's a good atmosphere yeah yeah i would say so yeah we have some uh, uh yeah, you have to wear a mask when you go to the cabina or the dressing room and, and uh, yeah, some, some regulations like that. But it's, yeah, it feels almost like the same, I would say. Yeah. Um, what is in, I would say, like in Kenya about it, Grace, is it that you have to do, you said like also like on a recreational basis, games happening or training happening, is there like a procedure which the teams are following or is there just, yeah, is there any recommendation as well? Grace, one moment, you need to uh, unmute yourself. One of the things that are uh, uh, the protocols for the clubs is that you have to have been tested for the COVID. Mm. You must have undergone the COVID test because okay our clubs are not so so big are not uh, so developed so our spaces are very small so we try as much as possible to to provide the social distancing uh, a mask is a uh, mandatory when you're coming in for training the only time you're not wearing a mask is when you're training and then after that again it's mandatory when you're out of the field you have to have a mask you have to have a mask on. Yeah. Sorry for the interruption. No, don't worry, fine. <laughs> I'm in the office. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So those are some of the protocols that are mandatory when going for the training. Okay. So yes. it means like you have the mask, you have the, but it's just a general things, a registration, but there's no testing required, like Percy said in, in, um, in Zimbabwe where you need to have the negative test. It's more similar to South Africa, probably. Yes, yes, more similar. The test, now it is um, it is between you and the club. Mm. To, okay, they have the faith that when you tell them it's tested, at least they can see the certificate. Mm. Then it's good to go. You can uh, join in for the training. Yeah. Yes. Um, okay. I also heard, um, like, Percy, when you were telling me now about the regulations, and thank you, uh, Grace, about um, in Zimbabwe and what kind of measurements are taken. So you are a development officer as well for sports and recreation. And I know you are a handball person, um, but how does it affect your work? So the country, are you able to do anything for handball development in the country or for sports development in general? Or oh, you mean during the COVID-19 period, like uh, from the beginning of the year until now? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's quite unfortunate that uh, we were seriously locked down uh, when we were at home. No sporting activities were taking place. But otherwise, when I was getting in touch with uh, some of the coaches and also the National Federation, like the Zimbabwe Embo Federation, uh, technical director and their technical team, I personally noticed that uh, most of the coaches were getting in touch with their uh, players, giving the players some training programs that they were using while at least they were at home. Because as Sports and Recreation Commission, we are not uh, in charge of the technical activities that are supposed to be run by the associations. 
but otherwise the associations in person are the ones who are responsible for their technical activities. But just like you say that since I'm, I am a handball person, I was also following up on the guys and the coaches were giving training programs and these guys were uploading their progress and training sessions on video on different forms of media like on WhatsApp, on YouTube, on Twitter and um, also on Facebook. So this is exactly what they were doing. But as for me in person or maybe the Sports and Recreation Commission, the only thing that we made sure of was to protect the players from getting this exposure of the COVID-19 pandemic by setting out the regulations and um, the guidelines as to what they are supposed to do and follow during the period. But now that um, the rate at which infections are coming up in the country is uh, going down, this is why we as Sports and Recreation Commission have now relaxed the conditions to an extent at which we are allowing the teams to then start their training sessions. But following this, the, the guidelines and the regulations set by our Ministry of Health and Child Care so that we protect the player. So this is where we stand at the current moment. Mm. Yeah. yeah. That's good. I'm not sure, Simpiva, are there any questions which we maybe already asked for now through which came into the audience? Not yet, Nicola. People are shy a bit. Yeah, if there's anyone, um, please, anyone who has questions in between, what you would like to ask the uh, um, speakers here as well, please ask questions in the chat box. There's a question that just came through, Nicola, for ah. Kuda. Yeah. And the question is, Kuda, does your players wear masks during practice or training? How do you safely train defense when you face to face? Or can your players get tested regularly so you know you're negative before practice? That's for you, Kuda. From Robin Shan. You're on mute, Kuda. Okay, there we go. Um, thank you, Robin. Um, with, with the testing uh, situation, um, we are in the same uh, predicament as um, maybe uh, Pestledge, where most of our clubs cannot afford, I should say, um, the testing, because the testing is, is, is pretty uh, costly for them. Uh, so what we then do is encourage clubs uh, since the rate here is still low, um, the recovery is, is way more than the, the infection arm. So we, we just encourage clubs uh, to continuously do the, 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 the temperature taking, the, the data as well, so that they can just follow up uh, on certain things, then maintain the distancing and, uh, and the sanitizing. From my club, we make sure we have small groups. We do not bring the whole group together. So when we train with girls, we just bring in girls. Um, when you train with, uh, with, with, with men, it's the same thing. If it's a men's team, just bring in the men so that we limit the numbers of the people that come through. And I see here you asked about when you're training defense. Um, we have certain drills that we can do and some that we cannot do. But at the moment, I should be honest. We, we, we do train defense and it is face-to-face -face sometimes. But... Um, um, the bottom line is we, we just do the temperature taking, uh, sanitizing and, uh, and the distancing after training and uh, whatever, if it's just outside the perimeters of the, of the playing field. Thank you. I have a question maybe to, um, yeah, let's say to anyone who wants to answer you, all of you, four of you, because I know it's sometimes challenging. I know Adam said they are training as, as usual as normally. Could have said, you know, when we do defense, Handball is a physical sport, so we cannot always avoid the face-to-face -face or, the, or the physical contact. Is there like an, like an agreement between the players to say, you know, we are here as, you know, in a team and everyone should also be aware how they're acting outside the team, outside the training. Because even if you say we are a safe team, we are, we are feeling safe together, but what do I do after the training? Do you have kind of a common agreement? Do you have talked to the players to say, guys, you know, that is how I do it in my free time. This is who I need in my free time. Is there any agreement made? Not written, but just like spoken or talked about it. Who likes to answer this question? Maybe just raise a hand and I would. Firstly, Yeah. 
Um, right. Uh, okay. Thank you. Um, <laughs> okay, like uh, at the present moment, we've got our junior national team, the under 20 boys. Uh, there's a project that we are running here in Zimbabwe and uh, the Zimbabwean Buffet Federation. They are running a project called Vision 2024, mm -hmm. where we've got a certain specific group of players that are being trained as a preparation for the World Olympics to be held in 2024. So what uh, is happening is this, like I've uh, alluded earlier on to say is that the coaches and the team managers are supposed to be, and actually they are, regularly checking on the players and communicating to them to say, COVID-19 okay. is real, it's there, and you need to take care of yourself and your family as well. Mm -hmm. This family part that they are talking about, they are relating to their biological families and also the Embo family. These guys are going to get into camp uh, this week in, uh, on Thursday. And so what's going to happen is the guys are going to meet together coming from different parts of the country. So the coaches are then, uh, since they started training sessions, like visual training sessions with the players, they were telling them to make sure that they stay away from uh, the crowds without uh, any protection, like the issue of the mask and sanitization together. So this is exactly what's happening. And when they are going to come for the camp, the players are also going to be tested not just a verbal agreement, but also to follow the medical procedures so that they get to know if one is uh, infected or not. So there is actually an agreement with the players uh, that's there with the junior national team that's, uh, that is going to be getting in camp uh, on Thursday this week. Okay, thank you. Grace, what was your piece? <laughs> um, uh, thank you, Nicole. Personally, it's just the same thing what uh, he's been saying. It is an agreement. It is not something, it's just an agreement between the club, the players, the coaches. We should be taking care of ourselves because um, yeah, we are not officially allowed to be training. So we are kind of doing it against uh, the protocol that have been issued by the government. So we, we agree on checking the temperature, the social distancing. We try as much as possible to sanitize in uh, most cases, so it's basically it's just an agreement. But do you also have like um, like conversation between the players about it? Do you tell them, you guys, um, how who have you met, met or how do you act? How do you feel about it? Because I know sometimes people, not everyone is if, like agrees on wearing a mask, and it's such a different situation where we forced to wear a mask or we forced to say. I can't hug you because now you're my best friends, but I need to stay one and a half meter away from you because I have tomorrow training. You know, I have an important game. Um, so how have, have there been challenges? Have you been talking with each other about this also personal challenges? Uh, what we do is uh, before any training session, we usually have meetings mm. and uh, the emphasis is on the, our health. Is, mm. Our health is important. Uh, we need to have those uh, precautions. We need to take precautions, not only when we are in the field, but also when we go back to our homes, because we are going back to our homes, we are not going to any camp. Mm. So we emphasize before the meeting, before the training, we usually do have a meeting. And also after the training, we do have a meeting, still emphasizing on the precautions to take. Mm. Adam, how is it in the, that for you guys? Um, you know, you're quite a professional team. And as you said, it's also your work. Um, do you also have a conversation about like well-being? How do you feel about this? How do you have, have you, you know, it's, it's important to have an open conversation about also opinions and feelings. Okay, what and we um, talked about, uh, oh, sorry, Grace. No, no, it's okay. Okay, now we only talked about, uh, it's uh, the own responsibility of the players because everybody wants to keep on playing. And uh, when somebody gets infected and it happened to a couple of guys in our team, then it becomes a uh, big, um, uh, yeah, the, everything starts to spin. Everybody gets nervous and you, you, you can tell uh, in the trainings that people are nervous or not, not when, the, when we got the tests, it's fine. But um, yeah, it got, it, it's a lot of stress before. Uh, you know, if we can keep on training, if the game will happen, if, uh, if it won't happen. Mm. 
so we we only we've only talked about uh, their own responsibilities and uh, and nothing is really written it's just that some guidelines that we are all trying to follow and sometimes you get sometimes you can get infected even though you're doing everything you're trying everything uh, you follow the guidelines and that, then it's uh, yeah it's too bad when it happens but we're, we're trying to do the best yeah. And I think that would be like another question from my side, because we speak about like precautions, you know, we have to do this there from governmental institutions are now said, you know, you have to make a test, you have to wear a mask, but is there anything from your side um, regarding um, like mental support of the players, mental support of the coaches, like, like in this kind of direction that we, because it's not easy, it's not an easy time. Um, maybe, um, yeah, Adam, maybe you can like ask from your side first and then I will go backwards again. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, yeah, yes, the, the mental support part hasn't been nothing we've really talked about. Mm. Uh, of course, it's a big stress for, for everyone to, to have it like this, but I think we are still in a position where we are more fortunate than, than other people that might not have... Uh, uh, the support of a we, we still have the support with all the regulations and and all the testing and uh, yeah if 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 there's uh, a need for a a, a, ter a termine or a, something with a psychologist I think that would be easily arranged but uh, it's uh, nothing that has been requested so far from my side or the other players. Mm -hmm. Maybe um, from Kuda, from your side, is there anything, do you feel there is a need for that? Or do you have like maybe even like an open conversation about these topics, how people feel, um, how is it handled in like from your experience in your club and also from the Federation as well? Oh, Kuda, we can't hear you. Now it should be possible. All right, am I good to go? Okay. Um, so for us from our side, we, we did have uh, a few sessions with, with um, the coaches from the clubs uh, and um, with some executives as well from the clubs uh, as to uh, the feeling and how, uh, how the, their players are handling it and how they're handling it as clubs. Um, but we, we didn't really get an opportunity to really get in ample time or enough time to really sit down and map away, um, like have a proper workshop with them, try to get things done because there was a, since after the lockdown as well, we haven't been able to meet physically. So it was always online, but it was um, pretty uh, short and we'll just, just, just get uh, a word from one of them. And yeah, that's, that's basically it so long. I think Sim, there came a question in, I think from Holger or something about the news national teams, and uh, that would also guide me to my next topic. Maybe Sim, can you see what is there in the chat box for questions? Mm -hmm. The question is for Kuda and Presilege, and the question is, are there any, spe any special options for national teams or youth teams? Do they still practice or are there limitations like having reduced players or numbers or limited amount of players or coaches so what's the situation there maybe Perslich, do you want to answer first i will just try to re um i'm not sure that something froze maybe otherwise kuda can answer um so the question is is there any special regulation for youth national teams so Okay, um, we we have been in contact with the national federation mm -hmm. in terms of the the youth um, national teams. Um, remember, we had a, a tour for them this year that was cancelled due to the COVID nineteen. They were supposed to go to Zimbabwe for the national team games uh, for the IHF tournament. So we had news that it might be hosted next year again, but we haven't had. Um, anything uh, towards uh, that issue of national teams um, on how they're going to handle it. So they haven't uh, communicated with us in regard to, to any youth national, for any national teams. 
For our junior provincial teams as well, we haven't uh, yet done anything yet because we were only dealing with the senior league. We're focusing on the seniors. Um, the juniors, were, our plan is to start with them next year when, when we see and how things go so long. Um, so that means also like I would like to ask from the um, regular basis, so because you said normally for the national teams, what kind of possibilities of competition are there actually for, like say for the, let's say for the juniors for now, because you mentioned the IHF competition in the bubble, but what kind of possibilities are generally do you as a junior national team have in South Africa to compete? Would be quite interesting for me at least. Yeah, yeah, they have, uh, they have. Uh, last year we had uh, the, 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 the girls team that actually traveled to, to Zambia uh, for the IHF uh, Challenge Cup, uh, Challenge Trophy. And uh, we we're fortunate that we have 12 girls from the, from the Western Cape that actually went and participated in those games. Um, and it was under 17 and under 19. Uh, the same age groups are the, are the age groups that were invited for the boys for the tournament that was canceled. Um, that was postponed uh, due to COVID. So there is, there is a program to them. I'm sure they, um, we're just waiting, we just await for IHF to give the go ahead and uh, I'm sure SAF will then come back to the National Federation will come back to us and confirm on how to, to, to go about it. Okay, thank you. I see Percy is back on. Um, maybe you can just answer the question as well on your side, how is the regulation for opportunity for youth national teams? Uh, sorry, Nicola, my connection is not very poor. I didn't get the question. Maybe you can come again. Um, the question was um, from um, ask, what are the opportunities or regulations for youth national teams in Zimbabwe to still play? Maybe are they have to have less players on the field or less people training? So is there any how is, is going on with the youth national teams? Uh, okay, thank you. Um, in terms of the regulations, uh, just like I've alluded earlier on, what's happening on the ground is that um, the national teams are allowed to train, but only to follow the stipulated uh, regulations from the World Health Organization. Mm -hmm. Okay, Percy, you're back. So we lost Percy now, and I think we will wait until he might come back again. So Sim, is there another question which we can ask in the meantime? Not yet, Nicola. Okay, because uh, I, ah, I think he is still gone. But I have a question to Grace, and I would like to stay a little bit with the topic: national teams, national players, because I believe as well that there are uh, different opportunities and experience in this field. Um, so Grace, you have been also a national player and um, in Kenya, a female player. Um, how was your experience? Um, yeah, as a, as a female national player in Kenya? Just a bit, little bit talk out of the box. <laughs> <laughs> uh, quite okay. Uh, my experience, let me say it wasn't that, it wasn't very bad. Huh? Considering uh, we don't play professional handball in Kenya, it's like you have to have another profession. So handball is also, it's a way of recreation or it's for the love of, for your passion of sports. Mm. So personally, my employer wasn't a, a bad employer. He could give me time for training. He could give me time off for the competitions and the tournaments. So personally, my experience wasn't that bad. Um, the only other difficulties we might uh, I, I, I did experience maybe was from getting all of us together as a team because not everyone not not everyone um, uh, worked where I worked mm. so sometimes assembling the team would take long would like be given a deadline for a, a week and after that week is over and the, the club is not yet full not everyone is available so we still had to start training while waiting for people, waiting for people, which definitely distorted our training. Mm. But we are grateful. We did um, manage to do whatever we could. 
So that means that you were um, like from a club level, you are often very connected to also a company as I understood it and the company supports uh, like the club, but also you as a player in the club. Yes, most of the most of our clubs in Kenya are supported by companies uh, or you can find like um, a small town coming up with a club so they get the support from the from the town but mm. most of them are supported by companies which they also have challenges when they are going through hard times we also have go through hard times mm. yes. okay but then it's mm -hmm. like so you and what you just said the challenge is um i think in german we always like the time you know when we say we start at six we start at six so five before six everyone is already at latest with their shoes mm -hmm. on in the gym so and you said regarding the different places where people work, sometimes it's also in, it affected the training. Is yes. that correct? And what yes, are the yes, expenses? Yes. What is it? Um, because you are in, where are you based? Give us a bit of an insight. Mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> okay, what we would usually do, we would try as much as possible, mm. set a time that is more comfortable for everyone. Mm. Like then train very early in the morning, if if uh, we could, if we could not assemble all the players, we would try as much as possible sit down and come up with a timing that would uh, would uh, make sure that if not most all of the players are capable of attending the training on time, because okay time is also a very big issue. Mm. So so at least we'd set a time that would uh, would make sure that everybody would be available, and then uh, maybe three or four weeks before the tournament. Uh, people would uh, be requested, the players would be requested to request for time off from their employers so that they would be fully in the training. That is from morning to evening or be in a camp. Okay. Yes. That's great. Yeah, Adam, maybe from your side, um, you have been growing up in Sweden and um, played there for different teams. Um, I think Malmö was the last time and then since last year, you're now in um, Germany as well. So how is your experience so from as, as a player? How are the, yeah, is it um, something which surprised you? How can you share maybe, maybe also the difference between um, what you experience maybe as a player in Sweden compared to Germany? Are there any difference from the trainings? Uh, the trainings are, I would say it's not that big of a difference. Sweden mm -hmm. and Germany is quite similar. Uh, of course, now it's, uh, like we already said, with all the restrictions, uh, of course, it's different during this time. But uh, on a general basis, I would say it's uh, not, a, not a big difference. Mm. Uh, in Sweden, I also worked. Uh, beside, I had two professions, handball and uh, another job. Mm. And now I also do. Uh, but it was still no problem to, to be able to have a set date and a set time to, to be able to arrange the trainings. And uh, yeah, I think it's just a little bit more, uh, how do you say, like established and uh, easier to, to make everything work uh, without being like disrespectful or, or anything. It's like different stages of uh, uh, how far handball has come in, in the different countries also with how established mm. it is. But from your side, you're, because you said you also had a, had a job beside, so your yeah. employee was also, was it an arrangement also between the club and the company? Because sometimes there are arrangements mm -hmm. um, that, the, or how was it on your side? Uh, it wasn't any special arrangement, no. Uh, I, but we, I was able to, to work part-time. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you could call it an arrangement, but that was mostly between me and the, and the, and the, my, Arbeitgeber or yeah, the company. Yes, exactly. yeah, employee. Yeah. Okay, good. Thank you so much. I think there was a question. Sim, please. Yes, firstly, before the question, I think there's a comment from Gibson Liari, and he's saying, I think in Kenya, most of the clubs playing in the league are also university based and facilitated by the university, and currently the institutions are closed. Um, a question for all the speakers is, what is the biggest challenge you have faced during this pandemic and how did you address it? What safety protocols that you've implemented have been the most helpful? And lastly, what is your club's protocol when a player tests positive? Maybe some um, ask first the first question, then we can see who can answer that. What is the biggest challenge you faced during the pandemic 
And how did you address it? Okay. So maybe let's start with Kuda. <laughs> uh, thank you, Sim. Okay, um, we, the, the, the biggest challenge is the, the, the issue of um, the, the, the stuff that we need to use in terms of, okay, and like, I mean, the, 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 the sanitizers, we need extra masks, we need um, uh, the, the, the temperature checking, we need more people on the field as well, or more people on the ground at every given time when we think of doing anything to help us through with the maintenance of every other protocol that we set up to, to, to do. And that is um, something that has been um, pushing us behind because just getting those done and getting the assistance to do that is, 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 is really um, pushing us back so long. Kirsty, maybe from your side? Okay, uh, thank you so much. My sincere apologies for the bad network connection, but yeah, I'm back, I had to switch. Yeah. Right, uh, yeah. in terms of the biggest challenge that uh, we have faced as a country uh, so far, uh, looking at the whole uh, COVID-19 period was the player remuneration in terms of um, how they survive. Because most of the players looking at the local leagues and um, uh, all the handball activities, most of the people, actually it's uh, kind of 50-50 in terms of um, the participants, 50% of the players who play handball, they really depend on handball as their source of income. And the other 50%, they also have got their jobs and some stuff that they do outside the playing field. So in terms of the um, challenges that we faced, is how those players were going to survive when their employer was not paying them. Because the clubs were not running any business. Some of them are institution-based and they were closed. They did not have any income that uh, they were generating coming into their companies. So the government and um, the Sports and Recreation Commission together came uh, up with a relief uh, program way in which they were identifying players who really need help in terms of uh, getting the basic stuff they need for them to survive on daily basis during this COVID-19 pandemic. Mm -hmm. And there was a certain amount of money which was given to all the players, not only handball, but all, sport, uh, all players from different sport codes who are well known to be participating in the clubs and also the senior national teams. Mm -hmm. That was the biggest challenge that we faced because we know very well that most of the guys do participate in the senior national team activities, but they didn't have any source of income way in which they could generate some funds for them to take care of their sales during the lockdown period. So this is the biggest okay. Okay. challenge that we faced, but otherwise the government came in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe the second question, uh, Sim, we can maybe ask that what was the second one? The second question, what safety protocols that you've implemented have been the most helpful? Maybe Grace, can you answer that question? Uh, the most helpful uh, safety pro mini pro protocol that we implemented was uh, for the players themselves to take care of themselves. Because uh, we, it was like an ag agreement. We can come to the field, we can train, but now we are going against the government. Uh, the government has not given an okay. So our safety was in our hands. And uh, I think the more we talked about it, the more we were being told the situation is serious. And this is after the lockdown. We had a lockdown for almost six months. So after six months, that is when we started slowly talking through the media and deciding uh, we should go to, we should go for training so it is through talking having that conversation that was the most safety protocol that we had reminding each and every one of us that uh, we need to adhere to adhere to whatever is been uh, is been uh, communicated so, you know, wear your masks sanitize wash your hands keep that social distance yes okay um, maybe Adam, from your side, what you would say, what the 
what the best safety protocol what was implemented. I would say it's kind of difficult to to answer. I think uh, the safety protocol has to be the testing mm -hmm. for for us. It's such uh, such a big part of everything we do. Mm -hmm. Of course, we do the the mask and uh, we don't shake hands and keep the distance. But I would say the testing. Then you have it uh, on paper that you know. Okay, this person is positive or negative because there has been people that that doesn't show any symptoms or anything and then they're still positive and they have no idea why and from where so i would say that is the most helpful mm. protocol I hope. but i think i got thank you adam um and i think that is something like a difference on the one hand if you have the option to test it's good because you have the transparency and the clarity but you don't but it's only like for like a snapshot because you don't know what's tomorrow on what's the next day and i heard also from your talk before there was a week where your coach was um, tested positive and you were almost tested every day just to make sure you can play the game. So, but I believe in other situations, like if you maybe come to Kuda or South Africa, or even um, uh, maybe also what's Gray said for the recreational clubs in Kenya, you don't have the resources to necessarily test and have the transparency. But in this way, um, open conversation is also something which is very important. Um, is there another question, um, Sim, that we would like to ask? Because I saw yes. one really interesting question. Yes. I would ask. From, there is a question from Robin Shan. Um, in yep. fact, it's a third question from a list. And there's another one, um, which is specifically for um, Adam as well as Grace. Anyway, before I go to the questions, Nicola, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's someone, a participant called Hope. Um, I've written to Hope. Please let me know what your name is and which country you come from as part of registration. Yeah. Um, because it just says Hope. The last question, Nicola, is what is your club's protocol when a player tests positive for COVID-19? Yeah, that's a good. Maybe um, do we give this question to Kuda? What is your club's protocol? Because I know you, um, let's put your. All right, thank you. Um, well, what, what, what we do, like we said, uh, we do the screening and everything, but if a player that does test positive, which means that will be only found out if they are tested positive, that is outside um, the perimeter. Um, like if they have gone back home or wherever they are, then they will test positive, which means if we were in contact with that certain player, then we also need to, everyone that was there needs to isolate. Uh, needs to self-isolate um, and get tested as well so that we know we don't spread it um, to, 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 to other people. Though that is the same protocols that we are using even in the schools, in the workplaces, wherever, because we don't have the capacity to, to test before. So rather, when it comes out, then you just need to self-isolate, basically. Okay. Is there any difference from the other ones or are you taking it the same like Huda said, like self-isolation and isolation for the whole team just yeah. yeah we have we have some some different uh, contact uh, degrees of contact how close you've been to this person if you've spoken to this person for 15 minutes in a, in a closed room or there are different yeah, different degrees of contact and if you've been uh, very close to this person you also self-isolate for at least i don't know seven or ten days and then you do tests that's that's how we go about it also okay Perfect. yeah and uh, as for here in zimbabwe um after one test positive uh, it's more or less the same as in south africa and is what adam said but the only difference is that uh, we also recommend that the facilities be fumigated. The facilities that are used by the club, they need to stop the activities, fumigate the facility, and then they can resume their activities afterwards. Hmm. Okay. So maybe to the next question. Yes, this one is specifically for Adam. Adam, it's from Maria of One Team, and she's asking, Patrick Vinsack, I might say it incorrectly, and I'm sorry if I did. Patrick Vinsack, a player of the male German national team, has just announced that he will not be participating in the national championship in Egypt in January. What do you think about this decision? Do you think other players will follow suit? Will follow from other countries too? 
Adam? Yeah, uh, yeah, it's a personal decision. I know Vincek is playing in uh, he's playing in Tiave Kiel, and they play in the uh, EH, uh, what's it called Champions League, and they have a very high um, load, like game load. They play a lot of games, and uh, now that the season got postponed and started later than it was supposed to, and uh, I think he just feel, uh, feels that his body might not uh, cut it. That's a big injury risk for him, and that also affects the income in the in the long run for for him. And uh, yeah, it's a it's a personal decision, and I don't want to put any put any values uh, in 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 it. I know that this uh, happens to um, uh, players. Uh, the player says no, especially on the men's side, because they have. The players that are in the national teams always play in the in the top clubs, and they have a lot of a lot of games. Uh, I know also from Sweden, there's uh, th this often happens that that uh, to one two people, uh, one of the biggest players always have to say no. It's either family or uh, injuries or something. They have some bad back or a shoulder, and they can't risk to to play. It's very sad, of course, because everybody wants to. It's a big uh, window for for the sport, and everybody wants to to watch the nationals uh, national team play. But that's the situation we're in right now. Is there anything from I think from the other countries, like say? Um, I know um, personally, you personally, you also have been national player. Is there? What was the, like say that because I know the workload as might be the difference between the countries and the league because the Bundesliga is has a lot of games happening. But um, from your side, how is there has been their situation where players said no, I I will not ta participate because of different reasons, or is it in general that the that the workload is not as as high as um, maybe considered in um, in other leagues in the world? Yeah, um, actually, it's uh, a bit different uh, with us because uh, we do not have a lot of activities that we take part in as uh, senior national teams or even the junior national teams from this uh, part of the world uh, or side of the world, uh, rather, if I may say, or the continent. Mm -hmm. uh, and when these games come our way, like the international matches, uh, We've never had a situation where a player will say no because I've got uh, more game load, so I can't participate in the senior national team. They will be actually hungry for for the game, mm. and they will really want to come to to play and participate. Because at the present moment, we do not have um, more activities that we do have other than the leagues, mm. the local leagues alone. Uh, we haven't been traveling for any games outside the country, be it the national teams or the clubs. This is something that is uh, just coming up at the present moment, but of late, uh, we've never had situations like that. Mm, okay. Yeah. No, but I think it's understandable because there are different situations and different ways how um, probably the workload is. And it's always a personal decision, as Adam said, and there's no value to give to it or like to judge it in a way because um, it needs to be, um, yeah. Um, recognized and as Perslid said, said there also sometimes in some places you don't have so many like opportunities as a national player probably to play or to play outside the league so it's something which is really really um, well yeah you will be going there because it's, it's, it's a great chance but um, yeah um, I would like to ask um, at the speakers because we always have been I have asked questions um, Sim was asking questions from the audience. We might ask one or two more. Do you have a question to each other which came up during this conversation which you like to ask one of the others? Yeah, uh, I've got a question. Uh, I'm specifically directing the question to Adam. Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you again. I, I hear you. I hear. Yeah, OK. Uh, I understand in terms of um, the way we run handball, handball is just the same, either Africa, Europe, or whichever part of the continent. But otherwise, in terms of how we run our activities and management, 
there is a component of uh, life skills education, which is quite important. Basically, we are talking about player management of the field of play, and even the post playing period when one is off the court, no longer playing in ball, and um, maybe he or she decides to become part of the administration or the technical staff. But basically my question is in terms of life skills education, how do you handle that situation? Personal management of a player, how do you handle that situation in terms of their planning, uh, the post playing period, and also how they handle their life at personal level of the field of play? Thank you. Okay, good question. Um... This is uh, mostly a personal uh, personal decision to to be able to uh, plan for for this. Uh, for but of course everybody will will stop at one time. Uh, I know that there, I was never in national team or anything, uh, but I know players that came up uh, when they were very young and they started to play with national team. They got uh, this extra help from from the uh, Verbund. Uh, that they can uh, get because they, they have extra games and they are away for the summer and play and then they have uh, help so they can manage their classes and make sure that they get the grades and uh, when you get older it's mostly uh, your own responsibility to make sure to do studies or to try to plan for, for something afterwards and I, I don't know if I answered everything, uh, but some of the players that, that may have played uh, their entire life professionally and then they finish at 37, 38, then they perhaps start to work in the federation also um, with, and help uh, education, educating the players for, for the next generations to come also. I have one question to that, maybe to add to perfect ask question, because I know from the female leagues often, so we have often with clubs, there are like a range of like sponsorships from other companies and then the companies support sometimes, let's say the education of players who, um, yeah, and who are able to learn a job while at the same time playing at, the, at, the, at this club, at this local club. Um, how has it been on your side, Adam, when you, like from your side, have you experienced such this, have you or was it always, as you said, a personal decision that you make sure, okay, I have my um, education, I have my uh, job, but I also do my handball playing at the same time. So, or I, I decide I do a half-time job, like just this, is there anything like that will get guidance for you to give, to show you the directions? Uh, there are definitely uh, companies that are sponsors that, that help players. Uh, let's say if you're, if I'm, a couple of years older i'm 29 now uh, and when i'm going to sweden again uh, and if i talk to a club uh, perhaps they say okay you come here and you will play and at the same time you will learn how to do this job so the, there is some sort of safety okay ah, okay yeah so but i think i i answered it. there is some sort of safety net and some sort of uh, for players that doesn't ha already have an education and already have a job they can go to, they often make arrangements like this. Yeah. Firstly, um, did that answer your question? Yeah, sure. Thank you so much. Good. I saw Kuda raised, raised his hand. Um, Kuda, what kind of question do you have to some of the others? All right. Um, I've got a question to, to Pessy. Um, I've I've heard you saying uh, you have um, you, you actually do the you are you are, you are encouraging the, the national teams to do the testing as the government. Um, my question to you is: so when is it that does it depend with the level of lockdown or not? Also, uh, when the league when you decide that the leagues have to resume, are you going to maintain the same type of protocol where you have to test them before? Um, and if it's so, if it is so that you have to test them, do you, I, I, will you be able to, will the players meet the cost themselves or will you be able to assist them as the government? Right. Uh, thank you so much, Kuda. Uh, what's happening at the present moment is that the government is only assisting the national teams that are 
being cleared to participate in different uh, games, they have to apply for clearance from Sports and Recreation Commission. And Sports and Recreation Commission will then facilitate for their testing, only national teams. But when it comes to the local clubs now, it's a different case. Uh, Zimbabwe and Buffet Federation applied for the clearance for them to resume uh, their leagues and tournaments. But one of the regulations or the requirements that was set by the government is that all the players and the clubs are supposed to be tested first. So, you know, as you understand, uh, there is uh, PCR testing and then there's this other um, method of testing, I've forgotten the name, which is a bit cheaper, but it takes time for you to get the results. This is the one that we are then promoting them to go for because it's being offered in government facilities where in which the fee is uh, reasonable and affordable. So uh, as for the clubs, yes, we'll still maintain the requirement to say all players are supposed to be tested before they start participating in their leagues and also maintain the um, regulatory requirements the way in which we are talking of the testing of the temperatures, the maintaining of the social distance, the fumigation of the facilities and also the wearing of the mask. So yeah, currently this is where we stand. Thank you. Adam, Grace, do you have a question which you would like to um, ask the other guests? There was a question in the chat and I, I also wanted to, uh, Grace to answer this uh, also about the situation if to say no about to say no to the national team and uh, if, if she would make the same decision or, or if she would uh, think otherwise. Um, hello? Okay, thank you. Um, most players in Kenya are like, uh, we feel like it's a privilege to play in the national team. So rarely, nobody rejects the appointment unless uh, the other forces are forcing you to reject the appointment. Like uh, you can get time off your, your workplace or you can get off time uh, the university. Maybe you're doing exams and you didn't want to forgo your exams to come and do them later. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, I have another question. Since uh, the, the women's um, uh, national teams are, are playing now, and um, yeah, where are they? I don't remember, really. I was watching uh, Sweden play just a couple of days ago. Uh, but they, they, there are a lot of uh, the Swedish women player, uh, women uh, handball players now are have... Um, there are a lot of players that are having kids during their career, and then uh, they are, have a, the support, and it's been like a culture change. They don't have to wait um, until their careers are over for, for this. This is not a like a judgment that that okay now you are pregnant and now you have kids and now now you can't play anymore. Is there some 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 sort of support uh, for for you to to be able to do this the same the same way or is it, um, yeah, is it different for you? Um, it's not really so different because uh, most, most of the times, it depends on your partners. Uh, we are so, we are Africans, we've got so many cultures that uh, sometimes hinder us from doing whatever we want to do. But most of the time it depends on your partner and uh, you yourself as a person. Maybe when you get pregnant and you feel like, um, I'm still strong enough, I want to go on playing, you can come back. If your partner is okay with it, if you're okay with it, then it's okay. But most of the time, it's just the culture and maybe your partner. But if they're okay with it, you can come back to the team and continue playing for the team. Thank you. Grace, do you have a question would you like to ask um, to one of the others? I had a question written somewhere and um, I'm looking at my notes. I can't figure it out. Uh-huh. Okay, what I wanted to ask, um, most likely the players are, uh, this is in Africa, maybe Zimbabwe, South African can assist me. Do you have players that are from, for example, a player can come from Kenya and still play, uh, play professional, professionally in Zimbabwe or South Africa? And uh, if yes, how do you source for the players? How do you get to know this is a good handball player from Kenya and uh, would like you to join our league? question as well. Maybe Percy? 
<laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, yes, as for Zimbabwe, in terms of our local league, at some point in time, we wanted uh, players coming from Zambia to come and play for the local clubs uh, in the local leagues that we used to, we, we had at some point in time. So, yeah, it's very possible. So, what needs to be done is to have the coaches get enough time to identify the players from your league, let's say the Kenyan league or the Kenyan tournaments that you do have. If a club has got enough uh, resources to then finance the player in terms of uh, him or her coming down to Zimbabwe, uh, the transport, food, accommodation during the whole stay, and also the salaries and stuff, yes, it's very possible. Because at some point in time, we once uh, had a situation where we had players from Zambia coming into Zimbabwe to play the local league. And also, as Zimbabwe, we also have got some players who are playing outside um, our local league in Zimbabwe around Africa and also out of Africa. And they've been identified from different platforms where our clubs used to travel for some friendly tournaments uh, in and out of Africa. So it's uh, possible. Kuda, do you like to add to Kosi? I believe, um, I believe here in South Africa, we, before I think it was, the early 2000s or so, where we used to have players being paid to play handball. Then there was a period when handball just died down. And at the moment, we are on a recovery period. There's South Africa as well. So one thing that I know for a fact is we, we basically cannot, at the moment, we cannot call it a professional league where one can get a, pay, a salary in the league. All they can do is play. We play because we love the game at the moment. And, but um, like you said, uh, Grace, uh, before that, you have to have a job and, and do play handball for you to survive. But we are on the recovery path. Most probably we are looking at that as the bigger picture for us. But I think maybe, thank you, Kuda, so much. Thank you also, Grace, for your question, because um, like say, just to, and from my side, sometimes we as the handball also get requests from players, young players from different countries saying, hey, can you help us to get a club somewhere? And um, mostly what we are trying to do is to say we link them to the clubs or the federation that they can see what's possible there. But um, I believe also in Germany, where, where I used to play or for a lot of um, women players as well. So you always have, you might earn a bit of a salary, but you always have a second job or in only in the really first league or second league, you might be able to play on a professional level. And um, I think even if Adam said he was also working half time and playing at the same time. So it's, it's a lot of passion in this job um, or in the sports as well. So, and, um, and that is also, I guess, why we all also have been doing it. Um, I know there was another question um, um, from Gibson. Um, um, uh, Sim, do you like to answer that or tell me the question? Um, the question from Gibson is, do players who have tested positive and recovered face, who tested positive and recovered, do they face any form of stigma within the clubs or community at large? If that is so, how are you dealing with it to ensure that stigma is handled properly at club level? That's a good question. Who likes to answer that regarding it has, has anyone had experienced a situation that someone in their clubs in the near environment got tested positive? And how was it afterwards? I think, Adam, you were kind of like, um, maybe you might yeah. like to answer? Yeah, we've had uh, two players and uh, our coach test positive. But uh, when they're negative again, there's no stigma. Uh, so. We are, we are handling it well, I would say it's, yeah. Okay. Anyone else, firstly, Kuda or um, Grace, do you have there any experience with that? Uh, not yet, because uh, we are you know, just resuming the activity, so we've never had that situation before. Mm -hmm. Probably maybe after this uh, camp that I was talking about, that is uh, starting on Tuesday, maybe, but we've never had that situation before because activities were suspended. Would you, um, maybe from the other side, maybe someone can someone recommend um, 
if there would be a situation where players or where the player would be rejected to the training, let's say, would there from your side as a coach maybe any uh, suggestions to that? How you would you deal with that? If there would come up such a situation? <laughs> Yeah, well, uh, actually, it's uh, a, a very tricky question in situation at the same time. Mm. Yeah, but uh, probably uh, maybe what we can then do is to just to follow the uh, COVID-19 regulations in terms of uh, isolation and uh, quarantine of the players so that at least we can curb the spreading of the uh, COVID-19 within the playing community or the players' community. So, yeah. It'll be a tricky situation, but at the same time, we also need to safeguard these players because we still need them. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, maybe one last question from the audience. Is there anything left, um, Sim? Yes, there's a question from Holga, and she's asking, do the coaches use Zoom session or are there other online tools, for example, to practice like tactic, I'm not sure if I'm saying it correctly, or even athletic during lockdown? I think, Kuda, you mentioned that you were meeting online with the coaches. Did you, um, were there specific topics in the online meetings or was it mostly like updates? Maybe you could give there a quick insight. Um, yes, there was. Um, we were encouraging them to, 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 to go remote and try and get their players active. Um, for example, from my club, uh, we were doing that. Uh, we made sure at certain times, if we are to meet with, with, with players online, we would buy, we would buy them a time to come online, um, making sure that everyone is there, is available. We keep track of the, on, on, on the physical ability. We keep track on how they're developing as well uh, during lockdown. So we were doing that as a club. As a province, we were encouraging uh, the clubs as well to be to, to, to focus on the remote training more because we didn't have contact during the lockdown. So basically, we're pushing more on remote uh, on, re on remote learning. Was there anything implemented on your side, uh, Perstic, or um, did you? Yeah, uh, there was, uh, the coaches were getting in touch with the players uh, using the WhatsApp platform, sending them the drills that they were supposed to train on, like the instructions on how to do it and also some action videos so that at least they can see uh, what needs to be done. And also as a motivational strategy, all players were asked to post their videos during training session on uh, the Facebook platform because they were at the Facebook page and uh, also some Facebook accounts where the players uh, follow uh, the progress okay. of uh, once each other in terms of their training sessions and uh, all. This works as a motivational strategy for them. So this has been happening and they are still in touch. Mm -hmm. But I'm not so sure of the clubs because I've been noticing this within the national teams only. Mm -hmm. but the clubs, I didn't see anything. Okay. Yeah. I yeah. think that the same what like uh, Kuda said that sometimes it's different situations and sometimes even someone because they don't have an income at the moment. They also don't have the, um, the means to buy the airtime, like data to be able to access any online meetings. So there are sometimes challenges which not everywhere, because there's not everywhere Wi-Fi that you generally can meet directly. And, um, but as, I, as you both said, there are besides Zoom, like platforms, WhatsApp group, Facebook groups, where people still had been like just meeting and exchanging and trying to make as use, much use as possible or connection during this time. I would like to, because we are almost at our end of this talk and I really, really much enjoyed that. Um, I wanted to also uh, tell everyone who was here, we have definitely the next three days, two days, we have two more talks tomorrow at the same time. It's 12 um, p.m. German time, 1 p.m. in South Africa. Um, now I know in Kenya it's 2 p.m. Now I need to remember in Zim, what time is there? Is it also, is it also 1 p.m., right? Or between? <laughs> I think so. You could have just saying yes. Um, because sometimes it's difficult to get confused with all the times when we meet from different places in the world. 
And um, tomorrow we will speak about handball in school, and there are different speakers from the ECE Cast Academy, like Johnson, a trainer and teacher at the school, but we also will have um, Ali Pole, the South African um, president of the South African Handball Federation, reflecting on how is handball implemented in schools in South Africa. And um, um, Frank Harman from German, um, former also national, uh, like a coach and also now a teacher at a school, he will tell us how the situation is in Germany. So we have different, um, and I'm, I mean then from Sim as well, the Secretary General will be also joining us. So there will begin like a different conversation of different places, how can we introduce handball in school? And on Thursday, also regarding the Zoom topic, which we had now, we will speak about how digital solution can be used in handball development. And um, yeah, but if you are interested in more talks as well, you can always go on our website. We will have there the communication playhandball.org, but also we will communicate the next talks on our Instagram, which is play.handball and on Facebook, which is PlayHandballZA. So um, just to give a quick information for now in between. And as a last to finish this round, I would like to give to every speaker once more the, the floor and to ask, what did you take away from this talk? So what is most impressed you or stick in your mind after this conversation? Yeah. Anyone who wants to start, can I give to someone? Kuda, can I ask you? All right. Um, no, I've, I've, I've been impressed because now I've got uh, the, the knowledge, I've, I've got the understanding of, of, of how um, people are handling it uh, outside. Um, I know most probably me, Percy and Grace, we've got more of a similar situation and more of how we handle things as is most probably uh, similar. But I've learned also from Adam um, on the professional side of things as well, how things go with them as well. So it's, it's, it's pretty beneficial to us. And um, we, I, I, I did pick up um, uh, quite a few things as well from from what the speakers have been speaking about and things that we think also as an association we need to implement and also as a coach i need to implement that as well and uh yeah saying that thank you very much to everyone thank you thank you Kula. All right. maybe percy yeah percy Litch. <laughs> Uh, okay, uh, thank you so much, uh, Nicola. Uh, from this uh, conversation that we had or the discussion with uh, all those representatives from different uh, parts of the world, just as was said by Kuda, that my situation, his situation and uh, Grace's are more or less the same. But otherwise, looking at the current situation that is on the ground, what I've uh, managed to pick from uh, the two gentlemen, Adam and, um, and uh, Kuda, and so is uh, Grace, uh, also, uh, the strategies that we can use for us to keep Enbo going rather than just waiting for the pandemic to come to an end, but otherwise there are some considerations and also some precautionary measures that we can take at the same time, making sure that Enbo is ongoing and not just to wait for the pandemic to come to an end, because no one knows if it's going to come to an end or not, and if it's going to come to an end, when will that happen? And uh, also the fact that uh, while least we are in this uh, COVID-19 pandem COVID pandemic period, players are not supposed to be relaxed and waiting for the coaches to come back on the field of play. But otherwise, there are activities that they can carry out um, while least they wait for the sessions to start and also for them for, for their seasons to come back in session. Mm. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chrissy. <clears throat> Adam, do you like to? Yeah, I can also say something. Yeah, I also found it uh, like uh, the other gentleman said, uh, it's a little bit of a different situation and it was uh, interesting and uh, to, to hear about how, how, we, how we are still doing the same thing. We are the, like the, the activities we are doing are similar 
uh, that we are always like keeping the the distance and uh, we are trying to do the best with the, with what we have with the uh, sanitizement and, and everything and uh, it's been very interesting to just listen and, and learn about uh, uh, handball and how it looks in in uh, different parts of, of of the world so thank you thank you very much grace can i give you last but not least as well the word <laughs> um, thank you very much. I think um, the discussions that uh, were here were very interesting and also enlightening. Um, I'm glad to hear that um, uh, there are still some national teams that are still training, especially in Africa, because uh, I think we're facing the same situation or we are facing the same challenges per se. And uh, what I'm taking from here maybe is to go back to my federation and tell them that we really need to find a way to move forward because uh, we don't know when the pandemic is going to end, but maybe find a way in which we can make it safe for the players to train, especially for the national teams, because the more we sit and wait, it might be a very uphill task to start. It will be like starting from scratch, because uh, especially for the girl child, it is uh, in Africa, it is a, a little bit challenging. You might find that our girls are, are already mothers uh, where we'll be losing a lot of talent before their time or before they had thought of being mothers. Because of the, sorry. Now you're back. Uh, okay. So maybe, and the strategies, I've had a, a little bit of the strategies that um, the rest of the countries are putting on so that they're able to go back to the, go back to the field. Uh, that is what I'm taking with me. Yes. Thank you so much, Grace. I think everyone, every speaker here, Kuda, Percy, Adam, Grace, um, for your time to be here, to share with us your experiences, to give um, you know, just let take, take part in it and have a conversation started really across the borders and that everyone really can, can take something from the other one. And thank you, Sim, so much for um, for assisting um, today, for asking the question. I really am happy that um, everyone who joins this talk today, we will we recorded the talk and will upload it today on YouTube that also someone who has not been able to join us will then be able to watch it later. And if there are any questions I would say, and I hope I'm okay with saying that now, um, from the audience which comes afterwards, which you say, oh, actually, I would have liked to know that, or I would have liked to know more about that topic, um, please write them to us at project at playhandball.org or post them on our um, yeah, social media channels. Um, then we can see that we can either ask the question to the speakers afterwards via email, so we would collect them and send them out afterwards, um, or even if we can have in the future a talk about this topic. So that's from my side. I thank you everyone very much for your time, and I'm looking forward to tomorrow's talk. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.